If you can only remember small amounts of information for short periods of time, that might not be a problem. You see, that's the definition of short-term memory. Long-term memory, on the other hand, which is very long indeed in some cases, is larger amounts of information for indefinite periods of time. Now, as we were talking about in my previous video about visualization exercises where I gave you five of them, oh, you can extend yeah. both your short-term memory and your long-term memory, but it's really cool to know more about the differences between short-term memory and long-term memory and how they function together, how they behave together in order to create this wonderful holistic experience of being able to focus better in the present moment and recall more bits of short information for a little bit longer than 20 to 30 seconds and then have that information usher its way almost on autopilot into long-term memory so that you're able to do cool things like solve problems better. So if you like your memory to be sharp and to be able to solve problems better in life, get subscribed if you're not already, hit that thumbs up for the love of memory and let's think together in the future about how we can solve problems by having better living through better memory. That's what this community is all about. This is Dr. Anthony Metivier from MagneticMemoryMethod.com. And here's how I love to think about the relationship between short-term memory and long-term memory. I think about it in a way that's easy to remember with a simple triangle. And in that triangle in my mind, form it now with me. At the top of the triangle, you have memory. And then on the bottom left or the bottom right, whichever you choose, you have perception. And then on the other side, the final foot of our triangle, you have problem solving. So this is why memory is so cool. The more you're able to perceive both in the short term and the long term, the more your memory can help you solve problems. So what would be an example? Well, in short term memory, you have a lot of things that just come down to memorizing phone numbers, for example, which we don't do that much anymore because now we just need our short-term memory to hold it long enough to pump it into our cell phone, right? Well, still, we use our short-term memory to be able to manage those digits. And after about 20 to 30 seconds, without some form of elaboration or elaborative encoding, as memory scientists call it, that information is gone. And to a certain extent, that's bad for us because we no longer practice our ushering of phone numbers into long-term memory the way that we used to. And it's become kind of hard. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. If you're a younger person, you may never have tried at all. However, there are memory champions, and I'll tell you a little bit about their techniques, and I use these techniques as well, who use mnemonics to encode numbers very, very quickly, and then they can get them into longer-term memory. But that's just a simple example of solving a problem. You gotta call somebody, you need to get their number, your mind in short-term memory uses it long enough to get that information into your phone, and then you have the perception that you got that person's number, and then in long-term memory, that awareness of their number is with you, and you go, oh, Rick, he's the plumber, I'll call him. I won't remember his number because short-term memory only managed it 20 to 30 seconds, but Rick and his function as plumber has gone into long-term memory. Now, Rick probably prefers his long-term memory to work a lot better than his short-term memory because nobody wants to go around with a little weeny, tiny, little short-term memory, do they? They want the big kahunas of long-term memory, don't you? Well, we're gonna get into that but there's a couple of different angles that I think are really, really fun to know about when it comes to these two levels of memory. Eee. Now let's clear something up because I've had a lot of questions about this over the years. People say, well, I need to improve my working memory. Is working memory the same as short-term memory? And the answer is not exactly. Now, the first thing to understand is these are scientific terms. These are terms that scientists use in order to help them better determine what memory is in the first place. So it's not necessarily that you feel your working memory or you feel your short-term memory. These are just what we name the effects that we are experiencing and that we observe as having differences. So working memory is more like the workspace. It's like the desktop of your computer where things are managed. And then short-term memory is almost like the law that dictates how long that information can stay on your workplace before some of it goes to the trash and other parts of it goes into different folders. And that's not exactly the most perfect metaphor because it's not as if your memory of gym goes into one folder. 
It is actually broken up by the brain and distributed throughout multiple folders. And one person who's really cool to listen to about this is Dr. Gary Small, who talks about the brain as a kind of neighborhood. And so when you remember something, your brain just disperses it all over the place. And it's like a family leaving Thanksgiving dinner and going back to its <laughs> homes. And then when that memory comes back, back into your you know your, your working memory space because you're using it then it's like all those families come back to that thanksgiving dinner and they meet in order for you to be able to have that memory again in whole but it's actually a bunch of different areas that it's stored in and it needs to travel around and just like families will move your memories will move throughout time, throughout your brain. So we know that short-term memory is 20 to 30 seconds, even shorter, and then that stuff is gone. A simple way to improve short-term memory is to just play a lot of games. And so you can play games like solitaire amongst yourself, <laughs> by yourself, and that will help exercise short-term memory to a certain degree. You can play games with other people, and there's a lot of verbal games that you can play, just, just wonderful things, uh, word association, games and so forth. There's also Duel and Back, which a lot of people go to a software, but it's not necessary. You can just take a deck of cards and lay them out on the floor. And then when you uncover the two of diamonds, try to remember where that two of diamonds was in the spread. And then later when you find the two of hearts, you then reconnect it to where the two of diamonds was. That's where the idea of dual and back comes from. It's dual cards and you're looking at the backs of them and you're trying to find where they were in a spread. This will exercise your short-term memory quite significantly and all you need is a deck of cards. And the best part is, is if you do it with a deck of cards, you are giving yourself digital fasting, which will help you stay off the apps that are constantly interrupting you with advertisements that are actually breaking your short-term memory and causing it to go down and down and down and down in a burning ring of digital fire. Now, another simple way to improve your short-term memory is to just read a lot. The more you read, the more you're exercising your short-term memory because you're tracking details as you go through. You're following characters. You're following their actions, their thought processes, their emotional development, etc. And you all have to manage this while you're going through the chapter in a story. One of the best genres, if you're interested, is the detective genre because you follow a detective who is managing multiple details in his or her head, and that's why I wrote Flyboy, which helps you follow a detective who's learning to use memory techniques and all the details he tracks, and he actually uses memory techniques throughout this novel in order for you to learn with him. And his memory mentor, Jerome, is a blind memory champion who's very good with a deck of cards and memorizing it using braille cards. He is absolutely a fantastic teacher. And you know you can check this out if you like Flyboy. It is something that you know, people have said they enjoyed. And I wrote it that way so that you can get short-term memory exercise while learning memory techniques that will help usher information into long-term memory. I mean, the look. The feel. I mean, listen to the pages. When you read the book, you learn how to utilize these techniques. It's such a creative idea, and it's so inspiring to see. So if you decided to uh, get this book in digital format, you're missing out because, I mean, look at this. It smells like a book. Now, this is something that we all need to take into consideration when we think about short-term and long-term memory, and that is that memory starts to fade in your early 20s. And maybe not necessarily for you, but it is something that is a trend that shows up in science. Now, I am in my mid-40s now, and I've noticed that there is a definite change. You know, I still show up to practice memory, though. The benefits are too huge. But there are little cracks showing, and it's fascinating. I want to document this adventure. So again, make sure you're subscribed if you want to be part of this adventure as I continue going deep into memory. But, you know, uh, just certain things start to happen, and the difference between short-term memory and long-term memory really shows. Like, the ability to pay attention in the moment is impeded by pain, for example. So I have struggled for a very, very long time with varieties of chronic pain, unfortunately. <laughs> this is more than one. But uh, the ability gets a little bit you know, more, needs a little bit more discipline, a little bit more practice. And then that has impacts to long-term memory because if you're not paying attention, perception in our triangle of memory, then it's very, very difficult for anything to enter 
long-term memory if you haven't paid attention to it in the first place so that short-term memory can do its work, can percolate it. So these are things to pay attention to no matter what age you are. All the mnemonics in the world are not going to do that much for a thyroid problem, for example. So you want to rule all that stuff out because I can just tell you from being fat and drunk and hung over a lot of the time, the memory techniques worked really, really well, but they didn't work nearly as well as they did later when I was at the gym and still go to the gym three times a week, really worked on my diet and gotten healthier and healthier and healthier. Then the memory techniques, they were able to shine even more brightly. So remember, anything that is pain or not feeling good, that perception part of memory, if it can't do its work, then less is gonna get into long-term memory. So a public service announcement for you. So we know that short-term memory lets us juggle small amounts of information for very short periods of time. We've got some ideas about how we can practice that through playing with cards, we can do that with reading, and we can basically try and do some of the things that the memory champions do. So if you want to extend short-term memory, learn to do something like memorizing pi or other long sequences of numbers. I'll never forget when Marno Herman was on the Magnetic Memory Method podcast, he had broken a record in his country in South Africa, 1200 digits of pi, and the most amazing thing was is that he recited them in under a minute, and he recited them in both English and Afrikaans, which just sounds amazing. You can listen to his insights, how the Magnetic Mary Method Masterclass helped him with this project on the Magnetic Mary Method podcast, and it is something that you will just benefit from giving a try. You don't have to do 1200 digits of pi to benefit. You could just do 10 and benefit and then push to 12, 14, 16, 18. You don't even have to do it in even number structures, but it's gonna help you understand what memory techniques are at a deeper level. And it's gonna give you that short-term memory practice, but also help you usher information into long-term memory. And you'll see that process. And basically the process is just having images for numbers then laying those numbers out in what's called a memory palace, and then using that memory palace to do a form of creative repetition. This is not rote repetition. We know, and I've talked about it on this channel, that rote repetition reduces your critical thinking skills. That doesn't mean that there's absolutely no place for rote. There's a kind of dedicated rote that I use when learning music, but even then it's a creative version of it. And it is creative simply because it involves learning music, right? <laughs> Which is a creation as opposed to raw, boring facts that you really don't want to know anyway, because you're just doing it for an exam. So, you know, I'll just look at the same information over and over and over again. That's actually harming you. But using creative repetition in a memory palace based on mnemonic imagery that you've assigned to numbers, this makes your brain pop with absolute pleasure because you're drawing upon multiple levels of your memory. You're also honing that perception and you're solving a problem at the same time. So you're getting this holistic workout between all the levels of your memory, that wonderful triangle of memory between memory perception and problem solving. And you don't have to do it with pi if you find that meaningless. You can do it with all of the numbers in your family so that if the cell phone ever breaks down, you actually can call them or give the numbers to emergency personnel or whatever, which is a very fulfilling act to do. And of course there's insurance numbers, banking numbers, etc., that can also deeply fulfill you, give you the same levels of exercise and improve your abilities with memory techniques in ways that apply to other real life applications. Now to really dive in and make memory techniques your own so that both your short-term and long-term memory are being exercised, all the time and to have fun, you wanna develop for yourself a number of systems. You want a memory palace network, you want to have an idea, an understanding, a practiced understanding of number systems, word systems, so things that some people call peg word systems, 00 to 99 PAO, and I use a PAO based on the major, and you know you might just wanna use the major. I use the major without a PAO system for a couple of years, that was really cool. I've used number rhymes, I still use number rhymes sometimes, I use number shapes. I like to use all these things and have them in my toolbox and just pull them out depending on the task at hand. And then of course you also want a recall rehearsal system. These are all things that I help you develop for yourself in the Magnetic Memory Method Masterclass. And they are so rewarding to bring into conjunction and to have constantly available to you because you've trained yourself to use them in a way that actually they do you.
So you can develop your procedural memory with these techniques to such a point that they're just happening to you on autopilot. When you meet a person, you're automatically associating them with an image. When you're reading a book, you're just starting to use the techniques and remembering a lot more because you're associating and you don't have to struggle with it because you've developed the systems. You have peg words, you have magnetic imagery as I prefer to call it, and it's all based on alphabetical systems. You have memory palaces that you can assign alphabetically because you've just put in a small amount of front-loaded effort and you know, chocolate and kissing, they take effort, so it's not that big of a deal. And most people can get this done in a weekend. And it's just so rewarding to have it all working in your favor. And it will help you have such tremendous solace in life and the ability to learn and remember more the wisdom of your ancestors, the people who have survived all of these things that go on in reality before, and draw upon that to be able to make better decisions in life. It is about better memory so that you can live better at the end of the day on a moment by moment basis. So I have in the previous video given you even more in the form of some visualization exercises, five in particular that are gonna really help deepen your understanding of what your consciousness is, what your memory is, how to exercise both your short-term and your long-term memory, especially so that you can make these associations so much better that you place in memory palaces so that when you're reading, you can turn pages into memory palaces very, very quickly just by looking at the page number, creating an image for that page, and then making some associations based on what is being said in that book, and then stick them into your mind, rotate them around throughout the day, and remember that stuff for the long term. It is so easy. It's so fun. So if you'd like more, make sure to visit me at magneticmerrymethod.com and watch these five visualization exercises that I gave you so that you're able to continue this journey into memory. And I thank you very, very much. And I'll see you soon. And until we speak again, keep yourself magnetic. It smells like a book.